Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Hard 100, a video series documenting the culling of my collection from what it is to what it's gonna be. And that is a Hard 100 Games. These are the new digs. Do not be alarmed. I got moved out of the closet. I got a board game shelf. I got a bookshelf. Living the high life. You know you've made it as a board game YouTuber when you can run to Ikea and pick up one of these things. Not too hard to put together. The idea is that this will house my hard 100 when everything is all said and done. In the meantime, it's kind of a makeshift. So today, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be talking about a bit of a classic that got re-implemented and uh, re-released on Kickstarter recently. And as we've already established, I'm a bit of a bitch for them. So today, we are talking about a classic from a gentleman who has made a handful of games that I've enjoyed. One that I really, really like that's out of print. It's like $300 now. Hmm? Ladies and gentlemen, prepare to get that brain broke. Today, Brass. Brass by Martin Wallace is an economic something kind of game. Now, the original version of this game was ugly as sin. It was before graphic design existed. The board was what we will call functional. It was not what we would call pretty. This board is what we would call pretty. Now, you may have heard something about brass. You may have not heard something about brass. The rule book is small, but it is complex. I wouldn't even say complicated, just complex. There's like five things you do on your turn. You draw a handful of cards. On your turn, you play a card. What's on the card matters sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. It really only matters when you're gonna play one of the little buildings. All right, let's be real. This game is about finding the most efficient ways to flip a tile. And the most efficient way to flip that tile is different based on the type of tile that you are going to be flipping. If you want to be flipping a coal or an iron tile, you got to get rid of the coal and the iron. If you want to go flipping a something else tile, they're all goddamn. If you want to go flipping a port, you actually have to connect that port to a cotton mill and you have to sell some cotton, maybe, kind of, I don't know, you're flipping the thing. But the thing is, you get to flip that tile whenever you meet the tile flipping conditions on anyone's turn, even the other person's turn. So you always want to help yourself while hurting them, but it gets to a point, ladies and gentlemen, that you stop caring about them and really only focus on yourself. You can take loans and there's been forums online done to death about when you should take the loans. This is one of those games that will fall into the same category as a power grid. There are people who have gamed this game to death and there are the right ways to win and the wrong ways to win and we just got started so we don't really know that either way what's really nice about this board is it's kind of a legacy edition not legacy in the way you think of pandemic legacy but legacy in a way that you think of all the things that came before it on the front side of the board is the standard two-player version now this version was i believe implemented on board game geek and it was implemented in such a way because the original game, as far as I understand it, was only three and four players. And we played this one with two. It worked perfectly. The official Martin Wallace version of the two player just kind of gets rid of some cards and makes things a little tighter. The Board Game Geek version actually will change a bunch of things. Some things that we were noticing that we wish were different in the actual game itself was implemented in the Board Game Geek version, which we didn't play. We just played the regular version. Now this bird, this game is split up into two phases. First phase, the canals, all the waters, and then you're just connecting some things via water. Sometimes when you build something or you need coal, you have to have a direct route. It's a whole complicated mess. And then we get rid of those and then we bring on the trains. This is all Industrial Revolution stuff in ye old England. Jolly old England, the England. This game got under my skin. I got under Phil's skin too. It was the kind of game that whenever we were done, we wanted to play it immediately, but we know if we did, our brains would bust and we can't have that. But there's something about this game. Now, when you think of a game that's a classic, there was the original Brass that I believe came out in 07. And this one came out now. I see some design decisions that maybe are a little dated, but the core is really, really good. Now this might just be the cult of the new talk, and even though it's an old game, it's the cult of my new, but I don't have a game like this. I don't have a game that scratches that itch. I have Concordia, and I hear Concordia is really good, but I have yet to play it. But this one is really good. I know the components have a lot to do with it. Let me show you. 
So the cards are nice. All of the tokens have this black card stock that I'm starting to see a lot now, where it's not actually printed on light cardboard. It's printed on this dark black cardboard, and it just kind of makes it seem a little classier. But the reason why this game was goddamn was what they're calling iron clays. These are essentially poker chips that came with the game that are neither iron nor clay, but they're heavy, they clickety-clack, and they are beautiful. So whenever you're spending money, this is what you're spending it on. And speaking of spending this money, spending the money is very, whoops. Spending the money is super cool because whoever spends the least amount of money gets to go first the next turn. And while that may not seem like a big deal at first, as you play the game, it becomes a super big deal. And as you are flipping these tiles and getting everything done, there are other little minor things you can do. There's gonna be a lot of rule checking. A lot of rule checking as you're doing this. Sometimes if you don't wanna use your person's port, you can go to like overseas. God, there aren't a lot of rules, but there are so many rules, so many rules to keep track of that newer games will actively avoid. But it's good, this game right here. Look at this. This shiny box, housekeeping. Two to four players. Okay, we played it with two. I would love to play it with three. I don't know if I have the balls to play this game four players. 60 to 120 minutes, goddamn yes. 60 to 120 minutes, the first time we played it, it was a good three hours, but I think if we played it again, it would be a lot less. 60 to 20 minutes, or 60 to 120 minutes, one to two hours. Yeah, it felt like a fast game, even though it took over two hours to play, it felt like we were done very quickly, which was very nice. Ages 14 and up for complexity, I am sure. I recently heard or got chewed out or talked to on Board Game Geek from one of the people who did Sailing Towards Osiris, and they mentioned that sometimes the age restrictions on these have more to do with regulations and not having to do certain things than it does with actual age, which seems cost effective, but when I'm at the store looking at these, I'm not thinking about how low this was on your cost. I'm thinking about if I should play this with my fucking kid and not playing this with my kid anytime soon. What's also nice is the deluxe editions on Kickstarter. I am number uh, 10456 out of 20,000. It's a little bit of limited edition, but no matter how you can find this, if you can find this version, this is Brass Lancashire. This is the way to go. Brass, you son of a bitch. Mwah! In the hard 100. But think you are a game like no other. You are a game that made my brain grow up. My brain was a little boy, now it's a little man, and this game is... Okay, let me put this in perspective. This game has made me realize how bad other games are. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a couple of games that I've kept, and thinking back on it, I'm like, why would I keep these? This I'm not saying is the standard, because it's not the most thematic thing. It's tiles and flippings, and it's about flipping, about flipping tiles. You gotta find an efficient way to flip tiles. But the way you flip those tiles, and the emotion it elicits from me, and just the, it's not even analysis paralysis. I have a card, I had a hand of cards. I just have to play a card and do a thing. It's, I only have like five things to do. But when to do these things and how to do these things are really what drives this game. And if you are on the fence, if you're not an economic guy, I'm not an economic guy, this game, don't buy Power Grid, fuck that game. But fuck this game. Make love to this game. This game deserves your money, my money, everyone's money. Martin Wallace, you did it again, son. Or did you do it again? You have done it again. You will have had done it again. A long time ago, rewind, all them years ago. You did it again, Martin Wallace. As far as Martin Wallace goes, I like Ankh-Morpork. Discworld is phenomenal. I've only played A Few Acres of Snow once, but he's a name that I actually really like. I know his games are going to be complex and meaty and cook my brain, and I love them. So ladies and gentlemen, this has been a bit of a ramble because these rules are a bit of a ramble. You'll love them. Buy this game. It's great for my shelf. It's great for yours. It's great for anyone's. And if you don't have the type of friends who like this game, get new friends. Or get them drunk and play something else. Who knows? Who cares? Again, my name is Billy. This is The Hard 100. Beautiful people. Take care of yourselves. Peace out.